Okay, so this one I will consider to be uh, webinar five and a half because it's going to fall in between our two normal sessions. Um, and really, I'm going to do this one just as recording rather than pulling people together, partly because this, I don't know how many people actually use the transliterations or this actually impacts. Um, but uh, given the fact that I do know that um, there are uh, a lot of folks who are uh, working on trying to use um, connection and connection has transliterations built into it, um, assumed that there might be a use case for it. So um, I spent some time this weekend working on the way that MarkEdit does transliterations. The tool has a built-in, had a built-in process for Arabic that I had worked with a user on putting together. Um, it was fairly limited uh, in terms of how the process worked. Uh, I went ahead and extended it so that um, transliterations be run over an entire file, uh, which is probably one of the things that had been uh, missing. Uh, but to do that, I had to think about how the tool would approach the process. So uh, if you remember Mark Edit being Mark Agnostic, um, doesn't have rules built in specifically about how to do things. And so um, this was always a challenge with the transliteration code because there are fields that you would transliterate um, and there are subfields you would exclude from that process and so um, without building specific rules into the tool um, it was very difficult to think about how that would be approached so uh, this weekend I had an opportunity to finally sit down because I had some free time to look at uh, some configuration files that the Library of Congress had been nice enough to send to me. Uh, these were the configuration files that they use for um, uh, internal program that they use uh, to do transliterations. It covers a number of languages. Um, and so uh, I spent some time seeing how easy it would be to take the process, uh, at least the configuration information, the, the hard work that they had done, uh, writing the rules to map uh, the transliteration to, to map the transliterations from uh, Latin to a language and then essentially working on a process to reverse those back to uh, Latin um, non-Romanized so to, to figure out how that how possible that would be and so um, I, I went ahead and added three languages um, uh, picked ones that had um, the most simplified configuration information so I could make sure the process would work um, so in addition to the Arabic, which is uh, my own process, uh, which works slightly differently, um, there's Bulgarian, uh, Russian, and now Ukrainian. Um, I'm looking at adding uh, these additional languages. These are the languages that um, the uh, Library of Congress have provided me, uh, Belarusian, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese Wade Gill's de Opinion, which um, I'm not super familiar with, so that'll be interesting to look at. Um, classical Greek, which I have no idea what that is at the moment in terms of like if this is like modern Greek or really classical Greek. Um, Hebrew, Japanese, uh, Korean, uh, Serbian, Urdu, and Yiddish. These are the languages that they provided me. Um, so these will be the languages that I'll work on next. Um, looking at the configuration files and trying to do ones that um, will be the easiest to migrate first and surprise, unsurprisingly, those will be uh, Serbian, uh, Belarusian, um, I think classical Greek, um, looks like a lot of the uh, Middle Eastern and Asian languages are a little bit more complicated. Uh, so I will do those um, as I work up to it. So. Um, that's kind of the, the expected process. So the transliteration functionality, um, originally the way that the tool worked was that um, the tool had two modes. One was that it could transliterate data that was placed in uh, copied. And so it would do whatever was copied to the clipboard. Um, the other one was that you would copy data to um, uh, in the mark editor select the planet transliteration tool, would open it into a window, um, and then transliterate the data, and then you would copy what you needed um, from the process pulled over. Um, and the reason why it was a mediated process was, again, MarkEdit didn't have um, the, the built-in rules in the tool 
to talk about what should and shouldn't be transliterated. Whatever was put into the, um, the file or into that window um, was transformed, um, which isn't obviously right in all contexts. So what I ended up doing was ended up building in a set of transliteration rules. And so probably the easiest way to walk through this, because uh, this is going to be a really fast um, recording, is to basically just show you how the new process works, how it worked in the past, um, and where the rules files live um, so that you can see how and what kind of options you have. All right, so I have mark at it here. All right, and I went ahead and downloaded a couple files from uh, OCLC, so I have an Arabic example and some Russian examples. So those will be the two files that I'll work with. All right, so let's start with um, how you set up uh, transliteration uh, setup rules. So inside the options, there is a new preference, um, at least right for right now, under other. Um, if you remember, other is kind of where I put things when I don't really have a good place for it, so I'm kind of trying to think about where I might put this, but if you go down to the bottom of the other section, you'll find um, a new option called transliteration rules. There are three places that, uh, three rules that get set up. First one is included fields. So included fields um, is a comma delimited list of all of the fields that if processed and mark edit identifies that you're transliterating a field will um, be converted. So if you run mark edit's transliteration process over an entire file, the file is going, the tool is going to look for these included fields as um, fields that are candidates for transliteration. Um, the second option is which subfields do you exclude from the transliteration process? These are always excluded. So in this case, um, I pulled the configuration um, settings from the Library of Congress. The uh, settings that they use in their transliteration program always exclude subfield U, V, X, Y, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Um, those are um, the fields they always exclude, so I'm using that as my base. Um, if you want to change that, you can update that list. And mark edit will include or exclude subfields within the included fields list um, based on the values that you include in that space. That is not a comma delimited field. This is just a field where you enter in all the subfields. Since um, subfields are single characters, um, this reads as single characters and we'll pull those apart um, uh, that way. The last option, again, is a comma delimited list and it's excluding um, subfields by tags. So in cases where we have um, fields that we know that we want to transliterate, there are going to be subfields within those um, fields that are needing to be excluded, but shouldn't be in the always excluded list. And so again, um, for the purposes of setting this up, I went ahead and used um, the options that the Library of Congress uses internally as the basis um, for the exclude by tag list, um, but users are welcome to expand this list um, or shrink it depending on uh, their needs. Um, and again, um, it's a common to delimited list. The tool expects that you'll have a field, a subfield um, in this function. Otherwise it will potentially throw an error and, and stop the process again. This is exclude tags by subfields. If you want to exclude a control field, you would include that in the included fields. Uh, you, would, you would make sure that that wasn't in the included fields for processing. So exclude, exclude by tag subfields are, are records that only have um, field numbers and subfield codes. So by putting this into um, a configuration file, um, I have given everybody by default um, the settings that uh, the Library of Congress utilizes for Mark 21. Um, if you were a user in a different flavor of Mark um, that uh, also wanted to use the transliteration code, um, you could update the transliteration rules, 
pointing to the fields to include and to exclude. And MarkEdit would use those rules um, in your Mark um, flavor and work with it appropriately. The other caveat when working with transliteration code is obviously for transliteration, the tool is expecting data that gets output in Unicode. So the tool is looking to uh, assuming that transliterations are being done um, on files that uh, are Unicode based because the output is going to have to be um, preferred to be Unicode. Um, you can output data um, like this in, in, uh, in Mark 8, but not particularly. Um, it's just easier if it's in Unicode. So the assumption that I've made is that the, uh, the data here um, will save back out as, as Unicode data, um, since the, the information that's being saved inside is not, uh, should be. Um, if, you, uh, if that's a problem, then I guess um, just uh, let me know and I can, I can rework the, uh, the process slightly to allow for users to save the uh, encoding in different formats. Um, internally, the program isn't specifically enforcing Unicode. It's assuming that the data is probably in Unicode, um, but internally, the tool does pass the internal encoding bit that's set in the mark editor. Um, so if the internal encoding bit was set to something like um, mark 8 or a different uh, text encoding, in theory, I think it would work, but I'm not testing it. I, I'm really testing primarily on Unicode data. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's how you configure the tool so that uh, the tool knows what fields um, are going to be processed and what subfields are going to be processed or not processed as part of the transli transliteration um, pro uh, as part of the transliteration from um, uh, uh, Latin to um, whatever the language is. All right, so let's see how this actually works. So you've done your settings. The settings are all there. Let's go ahead and grab myself a file. Uh, so I will go ahead and grab uh, my Arabic test file. So this is a test file that has um, no 880s. So MarkEdit is going to generate 880s as part of this process. Uh, so I went ahead and downloaded some, some data. All right. So the way that the process works is twofold. Um, you can transliterate on data that you select. You can transliterate on data and, and just copy it to the clipboard. You can transliterate on and select data that moves it to the dialog box and then facilitate whatever shows up there. Or you can um, do the entire file. So I'm going to show you all three. So let's say um, I wanted to transliterate and I'm not going to do real stuff. Let's say I wanted to do um, um, this particular value right here. Uh, in the 264. So I can select as much data as I want to transliterate. So I'm going to go ahead and take all that data. I can right click on it, transliterate to Arabic, and the result's been copied to the clipboard. I can then go back here. And paste the results. So the, the process uh, takes the information that's found in the, uh, the initial um, data set, uh, copies it to the clipboard, and then I can paste it back um, for use. All right, so that's one approach. Second approach um, is copying data and then um, having the tool process it inside um, the application. So in that case, I might copy these fields. So I would select fields for transliteration, transliterate to Arabic. It pulls the data that I've selected into my source box, process it. The tool will utilize whatever rules um, were put in place in the fields to include and exclude. So you'll see that it picked up the 100, the 246, uh, the 245 and 246, those are in my rules and then it'll generate 880 fields 
um, excluding fields that uh, shouldn't be transliterated. Um, you can then select data um, and copy and paste that into um, your record set. The last option that's here is doing something where you do the entire file. So that would be tools and transliterate. And you check process file and the tool goes through and it processes the file for transliteration purposes. The tool is going to generate an 880 field and it puts the 880 fields at the end of the record rather than sorting them numerically. Um, that process is kind of a, a pain to sort through. Um, at some point I will sit down and figure out how to get this data to sort into order. Um, but I wanted to get this available sooner right now. Um, so it puts the 880 fields at the end. Um, if the tool runs into 880 fields um, in an existing record, it will remove them um, as part of the process. Uh, so the 880 fields will be um, uh, removed and regenerated. Um, but you can see that it generated and excluded certain um, subfields uh, through the process. Tool works on um, the various languages that are here. So if I take my Russian example, I have here um, a list of files that were downloaded. Um, again, same thing, transliterate to Russian, process the file. Again, it generates the 880s um, using the rules files that were provided as part of the, uh, the application. So the approach that I've tried to take um, in this is to um, continue to allow the tool to be agnostic, um, to try and see if I can apply the, the configuration rules the Library of Congress has provided um, and generate something that gives you multiple options um, for deciding how transliterated text should be generated. All right, so let's talk about um, uh, how well does this work? I'm gonna be honest, I have no idea. Uh, so I am, uh, when I was a cataloger, I cataloged maps for years before I stopped being a cataloger. Um, I always, uh, I've never um, been somebody who um, uh, is uh, able to read well other languages. Uh, I took Spanish and Old English when I was in school. Um, so, I can't actually tell you if these transliterations work. Um, what I can tell you is that they look like the records that get generated in OCLC generally. Um, I can tell you that they apply the rules that uh, the Library of Congress has applied. Um, so in theory, they should look roughly the same. So whatever problems are there would be here. Um, and I can tell you that if there are issues and you can provide me really, really good examples of, of what they are. I can probably walk back where the translation occurred and see if that can be tweaked or if it's a limitation of having an automated process do transliterations because there are limitations. There are places where um, an individual will make decisions based on the context of the data there um, and, uh, and choose one um, transliteration option over another. Um, so that's the caveats. Um, the other question that gets a, that might get asked is, can I put transliterations into tasks? At this point, no. Um, I have not um, put the uh, transliteration process into the task file. Uh, I'm thinking about it, but I'm not quite sure yet if it's feasible um, for doing it because the transliteration uh, the only transliteration process I could think of that would be able to be facilitated through a task would be possibly translating an entire file. And I'm not quite sure, um, given the limitations, that you would really want to do that as, not, as a complete automated process without some check. Um, if that's something that folks end up asking for, I'll consider it um, as a way to uh, potentially uh, automate the process. But it feels like this is given given the way that the process works it feels like this is something that maybe folks want to be able to look at before they they put into somewhere but um that's a conversation we can have 
Um, right now, it's only in the uh, Windows version. Um, I have worked on the Mac version and did all the prep work. The code that underlines the transliterations um, already has been compiled and works with the Mac. At this point, I'm just connecting the user interface with um, the, the Mac application. Uh, and so I will probably be doing some of that over the next day or two. Um, and once I have that process in place, hopefully it'll be easier as I add languages in one, I'll be able to update them quickly and put the languages in the other. Um, but the idea is uh, to um, go ahead and spend some time and, and facilitate uh, getting the uh, transliterations to be um, uh, on par with each other between the two versions. Um, so by the end of the week, in theory, um, a bold application will support as many of the languages as possible, and they will be um, in parallel with each other uh, in terms of how they work. So that's the process. Um, hopefully it's useful. Uh, if it is, that's great. Um, if you find mistakes, you can let me know. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take a look at them again. Um, the capacity to be able to change some of these, the answer could be it just won't, you can't change them based on the, the process that gets used. Um, but if it's possible and I can um, identify where change needs to be made, then I'm happy to do that and um, uh, go from there. So uh, if there are questions, feel free to uh, post them to the listserv. Um, but yeah, hopefully this will be useful as I continue to expand um, and fold in the rest of the, the LC's config files. And um, I know I'd mentioned it to them before, but uh, uh, this was actually something that would never have happened um, had LC's uh, folks who work on this not been nice enough to pass this on, because um, there was no way I was going to be able to do this work on my own, because um, I just don't have the language skills uh, to be able to do the, uh, the transliteration mapping. So it was really nice to be able to get a set of configuration files that already had identified um, some of the rules around how uh, the, the, the code points within the file change from one, um, one language to another. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this off and if there are questions, feel free to just reach out.